Would you pray with me, please? Father, sometimes it is hard to count our blessings. It's hard because we look around and we see unanswered prayers, broken relationships, financial struggles, job loss, cancer, death. And we forget that you will use all things for your glory. And so as we take in your word this morning, I pray that we would recognize the blessing of unity. That we would learn what you want us to learn about the goodness and the pleasantness when brothers dwell together in unity. Father, that we would remember that true unity is good and pleasant. That true unity comes down from you. And that true unity comes with a blessing, life forevermore. So help us etch those truths onto our hearts. We might live them out in the days to come. Father, we recognize the disunity that's happening all across the planet. We focus in on specifically the disunity that's going on in our nation. We pray for our leaders. Or we pray for brothers and sisters in the city of Louisville. We pray for Breonna Taylor's family as they struggle with the news they received this week. We pray for those in our church family who are struggling with the fear of this pandemic, which might comfort them today. Uh, we remember Miss Etta Jane Cameron as she prepares for her hernia surgery tomorrow. We ask that you would give her an overwhelming sense of your peace. As she goes into that operating room that you will be near to her. That you love her with an everlasting love. Spirit, come, please teach us from these words of yours. For it is in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. As we near election day, the polarization of our nation continues to pull people apart. The recent death of Associate Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg has only heightened the tension between Democrats and Republicans as both strive to make the case for why they should get to nominate her replacement. Both political parties rightly see the significance of this particular nomination for the future rulings on major issues like the sanctity and dignity of all human lives things like religious liberty and marriage as defined by God's Word. There's occupation zones in Seattle that are now uh, dismantled, but the ideology is still there. There's state governments that are threatening to leave the U.S. over policies that they don't feel they can agree with anymore. They'd rather go at it alone and break up the unity of the United States than try to come to a reasonable solution. Racial disparity continues to come to light, tearing apart families and whole communities. The overall spirit of division is wearing people thin emotionally. And the frustration is driving people to bullying tactics on social media, name-calling at political rallies and riots and protests in the streets. These contentious times hopefully help us see the value in unity and agreement. 
both of which are highly prized by God and desirable for his people. Unity is one of those things that may seem simple to attain, but in reality is far more difficult to achieve. The next psalm in our road trip playlist celebrates the gift of true unity. All summer long, we've been working through the collection of psalms known as the Psalms of Ascent. Songs that were used to help recall and rejoice in the great God who set Israel apart as his people and invited them to know his presence and ultimate reign. If we consider that by the time they sung this song, they most likely had arrived in Jerusalem where they were greeting and high-fiving and hugging each other. Their extended family that they hadn't seen at least since the last festival is now in their presence and there's great joy. It probably meant it was a good time to remind themselves about a greater unity that God offered than would be found in their family reunion. David is credited with writing the psalm, and while we don't know when he wrote it, most scholars believe that it was when the entire nation of Israel first came under his care and rule following the death of King Saul, making him king over a unified Israel. That makes sense. He'd experienced a great deal of disunity in his life prior to that experience. Like our current political situation, there were certain factions that supported Saul and his family line, while other tribes lined up behind David. There were probably Miga hats, that's make Israel great again, and there were probably dump Saul hats that people were wearing that contributed to this disunity. So, with the prompting of the Holy Spirit, David sits down and poetically muses about the blessing of unity, offering us three truths that you've already heard in our prayer this morning. First, true unity is good and pleasant. Second, true unity comes down from God. And finally, true unity comes with a blessing. Before we read the psalm and lay hold of those truths, let's take a moment to recognize that not all unity from a Christian perspective is a good thing. Now that may come as a surprise to you, but here's what I mean. We don't have to look very far in the Bible to discover man's attempts at godlike unity. Remember the Tower of Babel? The people were unified in their desire to build a tower that would reach heaven so that they could, quote, make a name for themselves. Their unified efforts were powerful. And God said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing that they propose to do will be impossible for them. Did you hear that? One people, one language, and nothing they propose to do will be impossible for them. It almost sounds like God is concerned that a unified people could possibly overtake him. Now that's definitely not what God meant here. For God is all-powerful and he is not threatened by man. But what concerns his heart of love is that their unity will further drive them away from him. That their unified attempts to dethrone God would lead to their eternal destruction. Unhealthy unity is evident in today's culture as well. For example, a nation that is united around a dictator who oppresses certain people groups for the benefit of others is not okay. Think of some of the communist regimes around the world. Or consider a political candidate who unifies people around issues that are contrary to God's law. Their unity is actually destructive. Even churches can subtly seek to create unity that harms. For example, we're called to be people of peace, but that doesn't mean it's okay to lie in order to achieve that peace. It's not okay for leaders of the church to make certain decisions behind closed doors in a deacon's meeting and make every effort around that conference table to appear united only to go out among the people in the congregation and say that they disagree with decisions that were made during the meeting in order to not have to say the hard things to the church member. That's not real unity. 
And all it's doing is subversively destroying the church. We're called to speak the truth in love so that we can grow up in true unity, as Paul tells us in Ephesians 4, 15 through 16. We've already read about it this morning. In the context of the church, it's easy to unify ourselves around complacency. Just come to church, hear a message once a week, assume that I've heard my gospel needs for the week and I'm good. I often hear it said during the nominating season when people are asked to serve on various ministry teams, I've done my time, now it's time for somebody else. That's evidence of complacency and does not demonstrate an attitude of working as unto the Lord. It's easy in the context of the church to unify around false teachers. Now, no one joins a legitimate Bible study group with the intent to study false teaching. But if the teacher isn't held accountable and the teacher isn't growing themselves, then it's really easy for false teaching to slip in. Just as in one's home life, unhealthy unity is a sign of dysfunction. True unity is oneness of heart and mind around the truth of the gospel. Well, if you have your copy of God's Word, let me invite you please to turn with me to Psalm 133. Psalm 133, you see the heading up there. It says, A Song of Ascent of David. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It's like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron running down on the collar of his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. May God write the eternal truths of his holy word upon all of our hearts. So David begins with a description of unity that we would do well to consider. Look again at verse 1. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. True unity is good and pleasant. Now, this psalm opens with the word, behold. Anytime we see that word in Scripture, it's a signal for us to take notice. It's like the flashing lights at a railroad crossing. Hey, reader, take notice. I'm going to announce or make something known that's really important. There is a benefit to dwelling in unity. Take notice. Behold, what I'm getting ready to say is countercultural. Our sin nature trends us toward disunity. Look at how the perfect couple quickly turned on one another in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve wanted to be like God, destroying the unity with Him that they were created to know. And through their destructive decision, they became ashamed of their bodies, therefore dividing husband and wife. Adam went so far as to blame Eve for his sin. Then they hid from God, dividing God and man. Ever since then, humans have been sin-wired towards seeking self-interest at the expense of most anything else. This disunity breaks up the fellowship of God's people as many come together simply thinking that church is supposed to meet their individual needs. The room better be the way we like it. The music better sound like the way it does on my Pandora station, and the pastor better get finished before 12 so that their tummies never have to growl. Church, we have to strive against that sin-wired, self-seeking nature of ours to remain confident in the truth that the gathering of God's people is all about God and how together we worship God. Together implies a regular habit of being around one another in corporate worship, life-on-life -life discipleship. It's what we're doing in our equipped groups. If you've yet to join one of those equipped groups, please see Pastor John. Reach out to him today and let him know that you'd like to be a part of that life-on-life -life discipleship. Together, 
We're to be united around the truth of the gospel. We are, according to Ephesians 2.21, growing into a holy temple in the Lord. Unity in the church is essential if God is to be glorified. So there's that word, behold. David says, take notice. There's something really special, something that doesn't happen naturally about unity. And David offers it. He offers us two qualities of unity here, good and pleasant. Now we recognize there are things that are good for us that aren't necessarily pleasant. Think of surgery to remove cancer. It's good to rid our bodies of those metastasizing cells, but the cutting and the stitching and the potential for infection during healing is anything but pleasant. The effects of chemo and radiation upon one's body are certainly not pleasant. We also recognize there are things that are pleasant that aren't necessarily good for us. A dozen Krispy Kreme good donuts at one meal may be pleasant to our taste buds, but it will be costly to our overall health. There's a lie of Satan that he enjoys kind of making go viral, and that lie is that real satisfying pleasure only comes from things that are bad. But to paraphrase C.S. Lewis, the devil can create no pleasures of his own, but can only corrupt the pleasures that God has created. Now, we could list all kind of vices here that are pleasurable but not good. Yet there's one that I thought I'd highlight today that we may not think about all that often. It can be pleasurable to stare at our screens all day. I talk about the screens, not necessarily just this screen, but the screens on our phones. It can be pleasant for parents and guardians to hand children a screen to entertain them for hours on end. But research has shown the effects of such screen time. And that research says there are negative effects on our children's cognitive learning when we do that. Not to mention it's hindering a development of relational skills that our children and the next generation and the generation after that need. So true unity, the kind that David is writing about, it's different, it's good and pleasant. Now that word good in biblical theology means perfect according to God's design. So God declares his creation is very good at the end of Genesis 1 because it was perfect according to his design. Unity, then, is good because God created it as part of his perfect design for human flourishing. True unity is pleasurable because it's part of that same good, perfect design. Pleasure, by nature, is self-seeking. It's individualistic. It's self-satisfying. But what unity does is it requires us to lay down some of our personal preferences, and that pleasure... That pleasure of, of letting go of our personal preferences for the sake of someone else, the pleasure of getting to do that is greater than the pleasure of self-seeking. So unity that's good and pleasant is something that has to be guarded because it can easily be fractured. Gossip, backbiting, complaining, grumbling, nosiness, they're all sins that can easily usher in disunity. That kind of relational disunity then affects one's relationship with the Father. Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, we cannot approach God. I right, don't miss that. We cannot approach God if some sort of offense exists between a brother and me. Let us instead not grow weary in doing good, but sow to the Spirit who offers eternal life by going and seeking reconciliation with the offended brother, then come back to the altar. Do you see then how good and pleasant unity is? Without unity, church, we cannot be in a right relationship with God. It's not possible. Dwelling together in unity 
bearing one another's burdens, building each other up instead of tearing one another down. It's more than not quarreling or devouring one another. It's actually delighting in one another. It's actually promoting one another's welfare through mutual service. See, that good and pleasant is rare, but it's a heaven on earth that we should be working to emulate. In case we miss David's point in the good and pleasant Unity, he gives us two illustrations, all designed to teach us truth number two, that true unity comes down from God. Look at verse two. It's like the precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. That's weird, isn't it? What exactly is going on here? There aren't too many people who would say that oil being poured on their heads was a pleasant experience. Most people today would be concerned about how to get that much oil out of their hair. So what we have here is a simile. Now remember from English 101 that a simile is used to compare two seemingly unlike things using words such as like or as. So David is saying that the good and pleasant unity between brothers is like, all right, so there's a key word. We know this is a simile. It's like precious oil running down Aaron's beard, running down the beard. I don't know what that's like. I don't have a beard, so I don't know what that feeling is like for something, sweat and all to come down your beard, but it's, it's pouring. So from head down, down the beard, dripping off the beard and hitting into the collar of his robes. That's what David says that good and pleasant unity is like. Well, that comparison is definitely between two seemingly unlike things. Brotherly unity and a head full of oil running down the beard, running into the collar. Those are two pretty much differing things. David is telling us about Aaron's priestly consecration described in the book of Exodus. The sons of Aaron were sprinkled when they were being consecrated for their priestly duties, but oil was poured out all over Aaron's head, an abundance of so much oil that it dripped off his beard and got caught in his collar. And David says that oil is precious because it was often infused with some delicate perfumes. You say, why did it need to have perfumes? Well, it was in an attempt to not push people away. He probably had a very earthy odor as he had to deal with so many of the sacrifices at the temple. But bigger than that, bigger than not wanting to offend with some sort of personal body odor, he knew that the aroma was pleasing to the Lord. The point of this unlikely comparison is that when the people of God are united, it's like a sweet perfume whose ingredients are given by God himself. Because when you made the oil that was poured on Aaron's head and it spilt down with that perfume, God had given the ingredients. He gave the measurements of what that oil was supposed to be like. So in the same way, God's saying, look, I'm giving you the ingredients for making worship pleasing to me. And like a fragrant offering, unity attracts when the world comes into the church and sees a mix of races, economic levels, and a mix of generations, it signals that something is different. It's easy to attract groups of like interests who are all similar. The world knows how to do that. Think about book clubs. You're all revolving similar interests, probably similar age groups. Uh, similar people have that amount of time blocked off during the day to go read a book and study a book together. Think about Lego clubs. Similar groups of people, similar interests, with a similar block of time in the afternoon or evening when children are out of school can go and build Legos at the public library. We get it. The world knows how to build similar groups of people around similar ideas. But when you see a diverse congregation in a unity that's good and pleasant, it's attractive to the world. And the world is curious about it. 
Well, David offers us a second simile to describe the good and pleasant unity. Look at the first part of verse 3. It is like, all right, there's our clue that this is a simile. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. Mount Hermon was the chief mountain of the north, while Zion was the chief mountain in the south. Uh, so good and pleasant unity, if you're in Jerusalem looking northward, good and pleasant unity was like a refreshing dew that comes down upon Mount Hermon. Now, the dew that came upon Mount Hermon was often very heavy, making the region of Mount Hermon stand out in an otherwise arid plain all around it. This means that that particular area was lush with both plants and animals that thrived. Now, both Mount Hermon and Mount Zion would wither without this heavy dew. So Mount Hermon was blessed because of the heavy dews that God poured out. And so David's point in making this comparison is that unity is a blessing that God pours out, bringing refreshment in abundance to everything it falls on. So what do these two similes have in common? Well, the answer lies in the truth that true unity comes down from God. In both illustrations, there was this concept of whether it was oil running down or dew falling down. What we're to see from this is that unity, like all good gifts, is from above. True unity is a blessing from God, not something that can be contrived by humans. Unity comes down. It descends from God. Human attempts at unity only generate uniformity. Uniformity is basically an attempt to squeeze people into getting along. Unity can't be manufactured. It pours down abundantly from on high. It's a blessing, not an achievement. Paul makes this same point when he's pushing for the unity that exists or is to exist between Jews and Gentiles. He isn't hitting hard on what they have to give up in order to get along, but on what they have in common as Christ followers. What they have in common is Christ. It's His work on the cross that achieved for us the opportunity to be offered the gift of faith. True unity flows down from Christ to the rest of the body, that's us, the church, through the Spirit. We are baptized by the same Spirit into one body, producing, therefore, a spiritual unity. Friends, the Holy Spirit is the author of Christian fellowship. Our unity is good and pleasant because the Spirit of God works in us both individually and corporately, turning our hearts and minds from an inward focus on self and sin to adoration of our great God. We're able to delight in Jesus and His gospel and teachings. Without the Spirit, offering faith in Christ from whom all true unity comes, a true unity coming down to us would be impossible. So it does appear that the pilgrims marching up to Jerusalem deliberately chose a song near the end of their journey that delighted in a unity that came down from God. It's good and pleasant when brothers dwell in unity. That unity comes down to us from God. And it's a blessing that's commanded by him. Look at the rest of verse 3. For there, we'll talk about what that means in just a second. For there, the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. The word there is a key word in this verse. In context, as David is delighting in a unified Israel, and he's writing down this psalm for the first time, there probably refers to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the seat of the kingdom. It was where God's presence was dwelling in the temple. 
It's there in Jerusalem where a people who have experienced much disunity in their history can now know the blessing of unity. But for the pilgrims who took up this song, and even for us today, that word there can be understood as what Graham Goldsworthy termed God's people in God's place under God's rule or command. So there, in that place, God's people can experience God's blessing. What's the blessing? Life forevermore. An existence that has no boundaries in time. In that place, God's people in God's place under God's rule or command. In that place, unity is found as God's people in God's place under God's rule or command. The church that's what we're talking about. The church, that's this there now. In the church, it's God's people in God's place under God's rule or command. The church, there's a command. It's the word, and that word goes out. Josh Moody says it this way, quote, true unity in Christ in the community of his people is the location for the delivery of his word, the blessing through which we may find life forevermore. The blessing of unity falls from God through the Holy Spirit. And within that unity, we're offered a picture of the perfect unity that exists before the throne of God. Where every tribe and language and people and nation will join the living creatures and the elders declaring the worth of our great God. The blessing of all blessings is life forevermore. It's a commanded blessing. And those in Christ have this blessing now and for eternity. Church, are you at a place in your life where everything feels disjointed and frazzled? Restoration begins by going to Jesus. For no other tension or disunity, or lack of peace can be restored without first seeing that one's greatest need is being restored to a relationship with God the Father. Jesus took our place of punishment and became a curse for us so that we might be united to God through Him. Yahweh's heart is reflected in our unity as believers in Christ. It's both good and pleasant for the Trinity to be united perfectly. In the same way, in Christ, we can model and express that same unity to a broken, disunified world. Flip over to 1 Peter chapter 3. I want us to sort of end here. As Peter gives us a beautiful reminder... Peter chapter 3, he says, beginning in verse 8, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, Bless, for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Because both of those things can destroy unity. So if you want to love life and you want to see good days and you want to know life forevermore, and we've got to keep our tongue from evil. We've got to keep our lips from speaking deceit. We've got to turn away, verse 11, from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Church, may we desire this blessing and recognize that being a part of a unified church, united around the gospel of Jesus Christ, a gospel that came down from God 
offering us life forevermore is both good and pleasant. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you that it is sufficient in 2020. Some might say, especially in 2020, when disunity seems to be reigning over the earth. Show us, Father, the true church, how to know the good and pleasantness of true unity. That our unity would be a fragrant offering to our community. That it would be attractive to those who are far from you. So that they might see the hope of a restored relationship with God the Father. Show us how to take this song, God, and walk it out tomorrow and the day after and the day after that. We pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.